Grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's have a little bit of art time this morning. I want you to get out your high-tech hand tablet. God has given one of these to each of you. Let me see your high-tech hand tablet. And then on your other hand, I want you to get out your high-tech finger stylus that God has given you as well. Now, here's the assignment. With your tablet and your stylus there, if you were to draw what you think would be just the most easily recognizable symbol of the Christian faith, what would you draw on your hand? Says the guy standing in front of the most easily recognizable symbol of the Christian faith in 25-foot-tall form right here. Okay, keep your tablet out. The cross is off limits. Something else. A symbol of the Christian faith. Why don't you write that on your hand or draw that on your hand? If you did a good drawing, show it to someone else. You can even draw it on there. There's many symbols, there's many to choose from of the Christian faith or of God's church. For example, maybe that you may have uh, drawn the chi rho. Some people may call it the PX, but it's uh, the, the Greek letters chi and rho, the first two letters in the uh, Greek word for Christ. And that has been an enduring symbol of, uh, of the Christian faith and the Christian church for a long time. You'll see it in stained glass windows. You'll see it in vestments. You'll see that in a lot of Christian artwork. Maybe you did a fish. Who did a fish? All right, a lot of fish out there. The fish has been an ancient and also enduring symbol of the Christian faith. Believers in Jesus would identify each other from that, uh, from that symbol. And one of the early church leaders, his name was Clement of Alexandria, he recognized the, the power of visual communication. And in one of his writings, he was writing about what are fitting symbols of the Christian church and the Christian faith. And among those, he listed the, uh, the fish as one, of those, as one of those symbols. And um, he also suggested a dove as a symbol, an anchor as a symbol, or he called this one out, or as a ship running against the wind. Did anyone draw a ship? Clement called that out, and this is a picture of a ship from an ancient Christian catacomb. It's actually been one of the most, one of the oldest symbols of the Christian faith and of the Christian church, specifically symbolizing the church. And so today, we are starting a new series, and as you know, it's called Crew. Not Dance Crew, not Pirate Crew, but Crew. And every ship has a crew. Now, there's some ships that have passengers, some passenger ships, cruise ships, ferries. There's some ships that are built for cargo, these big ocean-going freighters or lake-going freighters. There are some ships that involve people standing at the dock, like waving to the people who are actually on the ship. Some ships, you go to some ships and you'll see that. But every ship has people assembled for a purpose. That is, every ship has a crew. A group of people assembled with a purpose is a crew. And so we're going to explore in this series, and God is going to guide us through different passages uh, in his word. We're going to explore how God is telling this adventure story, and he has designated you as his crew in this story. Michael, God has designated you today in baptism as a member of his crew. That's right. Here, give me a salute there. Yeah, exactly. Members of his crew. So we are all, so what does that look like? We're going to use the term crew as a way of a memory hook of helping us remember this story that God is telling and our part in this story, that we are purposefully created by God, that we have been rescued by Jesus' work for us on the cross, and that we're energized as God's people together for his purpose. And then also, in our role, there is the part of waiting. We're on this voyage. It has not arrived at its destination yet. God's story is not done. And his word includes events in this adventure that we're involved in that have not even happened yet. So we're waiting. 
Now, you guys might notice that I keep referring to this voyage or being in a crew as an adventure. And let's kind of categorize this. You all have been on boats that have been an adventure. Y'all have been on boats that haven't been an adventure. Has anyone been paddle boating at Forest Park? Pleasant, isn't it? Yeah, I have too. Not really an adventure. How many of you have been on a pontoon boat on Table Rock Lake or someplace similar? Yeah? You're sitting on a lawn chair on the boat with your can koozie and like your, 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 your toes rubbing the AstroTurf carpet. Actually, someone pointed out to me a $104,000 pontoon boat that you can buy over there at the new Bass Pro. I'll bet that is luxurious. I'll bet it is not for adventures. That's not a picture of God's ship. God's ship is not this ship that's just sitting in some, some chemically controlled swimming pool. This is not a ship in a calm sea. This is not a pleasure cruise. But like our buddy Clement of Alexandria said, that God's church and our role in a crew and God's ship is like a ship straining against the wind or striving in the wind, crashing through waves with sailors letting in lines and pulling out lines for the sails in the direction of the captain. The way Jesus paints this picture, this is a hold on to your seat kind of a voyage. Y'all should be holding on to your seats right now. I mean, grab the person next to you. We're all in this thing. This is the ship that Jesus has in mind. When Matthew records in chapter 4, when Jesus is building his initial crew, his disciples, and he says to these fishermen, Peter and, uh, and Andrew and James and John, he says, come follow me. In other words, here, get in the ship. There's a place for you. I'll make you fishers of men. Or God's ship, the picture of that is in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus comes to his, with his disciples, there's a ship in a storm, and they're on this boat, and there's waves and pelting wind and rain, and Jesus says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. No one has ever had to take courage in a paddle boat. This is different. It's an adventure. It's a purposeful voyage. And our existence as members of that crew starts when we recognize that we are created for God's crew. We just start at the beginning. You're created for this. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wanted to make sure that the Colossian believers knew this. We just heard Eric read from the beginning of the book of uh, New Testament letter to the Colossians. The Colossians were in the town called Colossae, and they were members of this relatively new church that had been started by a friend of Paul's. Paul hasn't visited there yet. And the town of Colossae at one time was a major trading hub. Like international business came down here. This was Route 66 before Rome started building freeways. And then Rome essentially started building freeways. And the trade routes changed. And now, instead of being diverse and bustling, by the time of the Apostle Paul, this is a city that was in decline. They knew it. And the Apostle Paul, he'd been writing letters to believers in big, important cities, like Rome and like Corinth, cities where people stood up and took notice and sent people postcards from there. How might the believers in Colossae have felt? Maybe like, what does God have to do with us? We're this small group of believers in this foreign culture, in this rust belt town that time has kind of passed by. But God had a message for them. And so Paul wrote them this letter, and you heard the first part of that letter in our reading. But think about that first truth in God's story, that we were created. And what God wanted for the Colossians was for them to know these two vital claims about being created for God's crew that God's going to make during this series, throughout this series. And I want you to look out for that first, that first vital claim in that you're created as a member of God's crew. And that, that is, God's crew includes all of us. Paul is writing, <clears throat> and he reminds them about who Jesus is. Jesus' authority. He says, for in Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. That's a lot of prepositions right there. 
In Jesus, all things were created. Through Jesus, all things were created. And for Jesus, all things were created. Who was created in and through and for Jesus? All of us. All of you Colossians. All of you Webster Gardens. No matter how you came in here today, you're not overlooked. You are infinitely valuable and crucially important to God. Pastor Will shared in his children's message about how we praise God because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God says that you are created, that applies to you, in and through and for Jesus. That's not the only place where, we're, where uh, God's people have reflected on his creation. King David, who by all accounts was kind of a big deal. He was the king in Jerusalem. Yet he stood out and looked at the, re- the breadth of God's total creation on earth and in heaven. And reflecting on that, he wrote Psalm 8. Let's look at that together. Why don't we read this in a, in a litany style here. Would you join me in this? When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. Who did God crown with glory and honor? The people he created. You, if you've come in here frazzled, or you've come in here doubting, or you've come in here uncertain because of circumstances of life that have happened to you. God says you're the special crown of his creation to help him to be on his crew governing creation according to his purpose and his design and his direction. I'm not going to ask you to sing one of these, but it's funny how pop culture kind of comes around in cycles. And I noticed a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, maybe it was because of the pandemic, but sea shanties came back into vogue. Did anyone notice that? I don't know if it was 2020, 2021, and you'd look on social media and people are making TikToks of singing sea shanties. I didn't think that they'd be popular with the kids again. You know these it's these, uh, these songs, these nautical songs, what are they for? Yeah, they capture, they're, they're folk songs, and they capture some of the, the culture of like, you know, the seafaring, seagoing culture, but they're also purposeful songs. And what they, were, what they did was they were meant to coordinate various tasks from the crew on a ship. And the different speed or the different rhythms of these different songs, again, I'm not going to be singing these for you, but you probably have Gilligan's Island or whatever else, you know, it's going through your head to help these, uh, these sailors work in a synchronized way as they're letting out lines, as they're pulling up anchors. And so these songs weren't just for no reason. They weren't just for passing on stories. But what a picture of people working together and that truth that God's crew includes all of us, synchronized, working according to God's design and his purpose. How does that make you look at when we sing songs in church together, your voice blesses the people around you as we praise God together, as we come forward together when we receive communion, when we serve together, when we grow with one another. God's crew includes all of us. And then that great truth leads me to recognize and leads us to celebrate this second vital claim. Yes, God's crew includes all of us. God's crew also involves all of me. Not just all of the Colossians, but each individual Colossian believer. Not just all of us, Webster Gardens, but each one of us, you by name. Each of us and all of each of us. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist said, Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us, and not we ourselves. It's a recognition of our belonging. That by nature of God having created us, all of me belongs to God's we, God's crew. What does that mean? It means the cells in your body right now that God created means the way that God has wired your personality unique from everybody else's personality. 
the unique experiences, even challenges that you have had to face. Base. God has shaped you and created you into who you are through those things, through Jesus, in Jesus, and for Jesus, to live out and tell his story. So the church is God's story through, that he tells through his ship and through his crew. And you're the crew. See, you are not the passenger on this ship. You were not created for that. You were not created to be a passenger just waiting until 4.30 when the shrimp buffet comes out. That's not what you're created for. That's not the ship experience you're created for. You are not created to be one of those people waving at the dock. Have a safe voyage. Don't sink. Don't get dysentery. You know, it might seem that sometimes that it's safer on the dock. That's not what you were created for. That's not why you were created. You know, um, in 2015, my, uh, my, my folks moved down here to St. Louis. I don't think they knew that I was going to talk about this. But um, they moved down from, uh, from Detroit where I was raised, where we lived for like for, for 30 years. And I remember they're making the move, and they found a, a home down on, on, off of Lindbergh Avenue near Lindbergh High School. And, you know, when all of their stuff got moved, uh, moved into the house. But after all that move, there was one thing that was still left in the Detroit area. And that was this thing. This boat, my dad's boat, the Jesse Lou, named after my grandparents, that my dad had bought when I was in the eighth grade and my sister was in the tenth grade. And we had been on many, uh, uh, many voyages on that boat, but uh, he wasn't up for selling the boat yet. And, you know, we, we found out, yeah, people boat around here, people even boat on the, uh, on the Missouri, Illinois, Mississippi River, so he decided to bring the boat down. And many of you have seen, you know, boats getting trailered, you know, down the freeway. Well, my dad didn't believe that boats were created to be in on trailers, just as they weren't designed to be in chemically controlled swimming pools. So Jim King decided to take a boat trip. And that boat trip went up Lake Huron and around under the Mackinac Bridge and down uh, across Lake Michigan to the Wisconsin side, down the coast of Wisconsin, into the Chicago River, under the shadow of all the Chicago skyscrapers, and into the Illinois River, and down to the Mississippi River, where then uh, he finally parked it down at a marina in St. Charles. 1,100-some miles, 30-something days, sleeping on the boat, bicycling into town for groceries, tracking all of the weather and the conditions. He believed that's where boats belonged, on the water. Now, my sister, Laura, and I, we insisted that we meet him in Traverse City, Michigan, to join him on the, on the, the journey across like the open water of Lake Michigan, this like, 50 miles of, uh, of open water, uh, because in our minds, he really needed our help. I don't think that's true, but he graciously invited us to join him on, to take us on as members of the Jesse Lou crew. And so we got into some, just slipped into the old patterns. You know, we'd take our shifts on the, in the pilot seat or, you know, tie off at the locks or at a dock in a marina or drop anchor when we needed to do that, uh, stay in the river for the night. Um, I brought a copy of Jaws on DVD. Someone after 8.15 was like, well, why didn't you bring a copy of the Titanic? And I was like, no, that's dark. <laughs> this isn't the kind of trip that I could have done by myself. It's not even the trip that my sister could have done by herself, even though she's more capable than me. It was the kind of trip that my dad could have done by himself. But he invited us to be included in that crew on this adventure. Look at a picture of God's church. God is sufficient in himself. God has zero needs. But he created you. You are created in Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus because God invites you to participate in this way and on his crew in the family of God as a member of the body of Christ. You know, there's a way that we're reminded of that actually every, uh, every time we come in here to worship. You know, back in, uh, in Clement's day, for example, 
People didn't worship in church buildings. That didn't happen for a couple of, uh, couple of centuries where people met, and maybe many of you know this, was meeting in people's houses to get together to worship. But when church buildings started being built, people would, uh, uh, it, the, the architects, the people who would make these buildings, would design them so that where the people sat looked kind of like this. You can see this is a picture of our Friendship Hall. This used to be the sanctuary of the church, the worship center of the church. And the design of that architecture purposefully echoed the ribs of a ship. You might even be able to see that, you know, an echo of that just in the planking that's in the ceiling here uh, in our worship center today. And now many of you may hear this and think, well, you know, Pastor BK is just stretching an analogy here. The church did not come up with the concept of the peaked roof. And you're right. But ever since they started building churches that way, specific to churches, and this is the time for our, uh, our church arch architecture nerds to speak up, this area where the people would sit, what was it called? What's that? A nave. As in naval. As in navigation. As in navy. This area where God's people would sit would be called the nave, the Latin word for ship. And that's where we get the word for this part of our sanctuary. God as the captain, we are the crew. And it's a reminder to us every time that we come into this building that God preserves his people on this ship as we do this, as we're on this voyage until Jesus returns. And it's not paddle boating and it's not a pontoon boat in Table Rock Lake. It is an adventure straining against the wind. Because as we look around and we see our place in creation and we look at God's magnificent creation, we also notice that it is a broken creation. It's broken by greed. It's broken by jealousy, poverty, hatred, abuse. I mean, really, you name it, we've broken it. And it's a creation that's in need of restoration. It's a creation in need of of rescue, and we're a people in need of rescue. So I want you to stick with us through this series, because this is just the, the first part. We are created to be members of God's crew. Next week, we're going to look at his rescue. And as a reminder of that, I want you to pull out your, uh, your high-tech hand tablet again. Would you do that? Pull out your hand tablet. Erase the thing you had on there before, by the way. And get your high-tech finger stylus. There's one more thing that God wants you to ascribe on your hand. See, God's prophet Isaiah, this was centuries before Jesus was on earth, he was writing to God's people, his Old Testament people, and he was encouraging them to look ahead and to grasp a promise, a promise that God was making. And he was writing to people who felt like they were outcasts, people who felt like they were forgotten. A lot like the Colossians, maybe a lot like you when you come in here. But this was God's word through Isaiah to his people, and it's for us too. He says in this day, when Jesus comes, when we know we belong to him, that some will say, I am the Lord's. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. In other words, they'll say, I identify with him as a member of God's family. And still others will write on their hands, belongs to the Lord. So get out your hand tablet, and I want you to write, belongs to the Lord. Maybe you have a child. Write that on your hand. Take their hand. Write it on theirs as well. Tell them what you're writing, that they belong to Jesus. That's the truth that God calls us into, that I belong to the Lord, his crew, assembled for his purpose, all of us, and all of me. In Jesus' name, amen.